My father never took off his hat except when he was going into bed and into mass. And my mother said that he slept in the two places. <laughs> At that time, every man covered his head. There was respect for the brain then, a delicate instrument. As well as covering the head, the hat is a, is a handy receptacle. If you're cut short, you can give a feed of water to a horse out of a hat. You can collect up apples in the orchard. You can bring in new laid eggs out of the hay shed. You could nearly put a hen hatching in a hat. Well, a small hen, like a bantam or a guinea hen. Headgear gives a man authority. The popes and the kings and the bishops know this. They always cover their heads when they have something important to say. And where would the storyteller be without his hat when he sits by the fireside to tell a story? In olden days, when people would be going to the meadow saving hay, they'd take with them an earthenware jar full of lia ishke. And what was that? It was a mixture of new milk and spring water. For the new milk by itself wasn't the thing for the thirst, and of course the spring didn't have the body in it. And that earthenware jar, it would be put somewhere away from the heat of the sun, and no word of a lie, but it was a great man for the thirst. At that time, there was this farmer in the middle, a very fine day that came after a lot of rain, and he had a lot of help. <laughs> So that the earthenware jar gave no battle. By three o'clock in the evening, the jar was empty and the men were there, their tongues out with the drought. Now they were in the happy position that there was a public house not too far away from them. But they couldn't afford to spend the time going there and so much to be done. That same year, the farmer, he had a servant called John the Man. And the only thing I'll tell you now about John the man is he was not too correct in the top story. <laughs> when he should be shaking the hay, he'd be raking, and when he should be raking, he'd be barking at the dog. <laughs> that class of a fella. So the farmer said he wouldn't be much out of pocket if he sent John the man to the public house for a gallon of porter. And he gave him the empty earthenware jar and one and fourpence and told him to bring a gallon of it. That's all it was at the time, twopence a pint. Oh my, weren't we all born a bit late. And John, he said, keep your hat well down on your head in case that the sun might lean in your brains. <laughs> and John, the man, he took the earthenware jar and the one and fourpence and fixed the hat down on his head and he set out for the public house, delighted to be going on this errand. And he was singing a little ditty, Murphy Stout is good, no doubt. Um, it shoves the navel another bit out. <laughs> and you see the Amadon, he wasn't watching where he was going, and he hit his toe against something, and he fell out in his face and eyes, made flitters of the jar. He got up with only the handle in his hand, and not even noticing, not even noticing that the jar was broke. He kept going until he came to the public house. And he put the one and fourpence up on the counter and he says to the publican, give me a gallon of porter. And the publican took a big white enamel jug, a gallon measure, and he bent down behind the counter. Now don't ask me what caper they used to be going on with when the porter came in timber barrels. There'd be a pilgrimage from tap to tap. <laughs> a big splash out of the flat barrel and a small spot out of the high one to put a collar on it. And when the jug was full, he put it in the counter and he says to John the man, he said, where is your container for this? And it was then John noticed that he had only the handle in his hand. And he said, that's funny, he said. We were together leaving the field. <laughs> that might be, says the publican, but where am I going to spill this? And that put John the man thinking, and he threw away the handle, and he began to scratch his head. And he took off his hat to give himself more scope for thought. <laughs> and he says to the publican, look, he said, couldn't you spill it in there? And the publican did. He spilled the porter into the hat. Wasn't he paid for it? And when the hat was full up to the brim, 
there was a nice little drop left in the bottom of the white enamel jug, and John the man thought it was a pity to have to leave it there, the precious liquid, a thing he mentioned to the public. And I know the public said, should I know? But where can I put it? Your hat is full. Well, says John, he said, couldn't you put it in there? <laughs> So he did. He spilled what was left of the porter into the top of the hat. And John, the man then taking the hat, you know, between his two hands, he walked back to the meadow. And when he arrived at the meadow, <laughs> the farmer and all the men that collected around him, and the farmer, when he saw the small lake, a porter on top of the hat, he said, John, he said, is that all the porter you brought? Oh, well, now, says John, you must think I'm all right, I'm a dawn. I have the rest of it here. <laughs> music and good dancing and now for a change storytelling is said to be unlucky in the daytime except for fishermen while they're waiting to pull in the nets storytelling the biggest farmer in our parish told to servants when he caught him listening to the storyteller the day of the thrashing storytelling he said is a nocturnal pursuit and so it ever was when people finished working in the fields and collected into the rambling houses at night, bee telling was as common a salute as fault to wrote. And the man that didn't have a story to tell, he'd be as welcome there as a drop of holy water in the devil's whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Curtin, he was over here across the river. Johnny Curtin, he said he was hired out by a farmer when he was 13 years of age. This was at a time when a farmer's wealth could be counted in the number of boys and girls they'd have in their service. Oh, and those servants, they worked hard for very little wages, and all through the year, they looked forward to Christmas Eve when they could be coming home with their pay in their pockets for their parents. Johnny Curtin, he said to the farmer that he was hired with, it was up in the borders of Cork and Limerick where the good land is, but that farmer, oh, he was so miserly. He kept poor Johnny working all day Christmas Eve. It was dark before he gave him his supper and paid him his wages, so that poor Johnny, he had the night for 
company on the long road home. No friendly Christmas candles up there to light him on his way. Oh, he was so young and so frightened when he came around every turn. He thought a monster was going to hop out of every bush. And he lost all track of the number of times he'd gone astray. And coming up to 12 o'clock, the witching hour, he heard a troop of horsemen coming behind him. And when they drew near, he saw that they weren't from this world at all. For there in the middle of them was his aunt's husband that died the year before. And these horsemen then came in a circle all round him. And the captain of the horsemen said to Johnny, be telling. And Johnny said, I've no story to tell. Well, those spirits from the other world, they couldn't believe it, that a young man of that age, that he'd be out that hour of the night with no story to tell. And they were moving in towards him in a very threatening fashion. And the captain put up his hand and he said, let him alone this time, he said, he's young. Maybe he'll have a story to tell before morning. So he said to Johnny, what's your name? And he said, I'm by the Curtains. I'm from the parish of Kila in the Diocese of Arfurt, and I had oh, Oh, says the captain, you're long way from home here, so oh, I am, says Johnny. Come on away now, says the captain, and we'll have you home in two shakes of her aunt's tail. How could I keep up to you, says Johnny, in he all on horseback, and I shang smear. Oh, and the captain says to him, break a sally twig off the bush that was growing at the side of the road, and Johnny did. And the captain, looking at the sally twig, he said, gruig of the cown, solace of the hula, agus fecula id veal meaning hair in your head, light in your eyes, and teeth in your mouth. And the same to you, Johnny Cotton, if you're ever caught shot. And looking at the Sally Twig again, he said, Fiola agus knava orth, kosa agus krubo forth, agus erbult have here, meaning flesh and bones on you, yeah. feet and legs under you, and a tail behind. And the same to you, Johnny Cotton, if you're ever caught shot. Johnny wasn't too sure at all about the tail behind, but he didn't say anything. And then the captain, he licked his thumb like that, and he rubbed it to the sally rod and turned it into a fine bull calf. Sit up on his back now, Johnny, he said, and we'll have you home in no time. But I'm giving you one water warning, Johnny Cotton, he said. While you're up on that calf's back, he said, never open your mouth. If you do, it'll be the worst for you. So Johnny sat up on the calf's back and the little calf put his tail in the air and off he went after the galloping horses. That was the quilting down through New Market in Kenturk and headed through Quillany Cueve and over the county bounds and into Ramor. And they kept down the straight road until they came to Knockan School and they veer left down through Coraco over to Kilaha where Johnny could see the Christmas candle lighting in his own window. Oh, was he delighted. And when the horsemen, when they came to the banks of the river, the river Flesk, there was no bridge there at the time, the horsemen made one bound and jumped over the river and into the field at the other side. And Johnny coming up on the calf's back, you know, he was wondering, like in his own mind, would the little calf, would he be able for the big jump? When the calf came up to the bank, he made one spring and he went sailing across the river and Johnny up on his back. And Johnny, you know, he was so full of admiration for the calf, you know, that he couldn't keep his mouth shut, the fool that. And he said, say what you like, that was one hell of a jump for a calf. <laughs> he looked down, there was nothing under him either, Sally Twig. And he fell down, splash into the river. And when he was crawling out of the other side like a half drowned cat, the captain of the ferries came out to him and he said, Well, Johnny, he said, have you your wages? I have, says Johnny. And tell me, he said, have you anything else? I uh, have, says Johnny, I have a story now. But who in the hell will believe it? <laughs>
Johnny Curtin, I was telling you about. Johnny Curtin, he got tired of working for farmers and he went to America. And after about 15 years, he came home on a trip. I remember the night well his father's house was full to the wrong Christmas. All the neighbors in for to welcome him. And Johnny, he gave out American cigarettes to the company. And we were all mad anxious, you know, to sample the strange thing. Even the old lads there that were smoking the pipes, they put him away and accepted a cigarette. And when everyone was ready, Johnny Curtin lit the cigarettes all round. And they began to smoke and to make comments on the quality of this fun weed. When all of a sudden, the cigarettes began to explode inside in our mouths, sparks coming out of them. And everyone was throwing the cigarettes out and down on the floor. And they began to spark and light again on the floor. The house was full of fireworks. And all men there, they were palming their faces like that because they thought that their mustaches had been blown away in the explosion. And Johnny Curtin breaking his heart laughing at catching out the green hardens. Oh, the Yanks love that. Johnny Curtin, he told us from the time that he turned the key and the lock of his own door in the Bronx until he walked into his father's house here in Ireland. It took him as many hours to come home as it took him days to go out. For he went to America by boat and he came home by plane. That gave rise to conversation then about the great strides that were made in foreign travel since St. Brendan discovered America in a rowing boat. And there was a man there said that there were further advances would be made. And he said the next thing would be that a man would be shot up in the air in a special suit and he'd be up there in space and he'd hover up there like a hawk, do you see? And then he'd wait until the world turned around underneath him and then he'd open his parachute and he'd fall down into New York <laughs> or Chicago, Boston, wherever he wanted to go. They all thought that was very strange. And the historian that was there said, that it wasn't as strange as something that happened to a neighbor of his when he was young. This man set out to fly to America long before the Wright brothers were born, or Captain Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic. His name was Timmy Warren, and he was working for his day's hire, drawing goods from a railway station for a big shopkeeper. And he had good wages for the time it was. He had a house of his own, a nice wife, and enough to eat. And wouldn't you think he'd be satisfied? He was not. For whatever little deficiency was above here in the belfry, he never dreamt in his life. Whether he lay down on his left side or on his right side, on his back or on his bread basket, it was all the same. He got up in the morning the same as he went to bed the night before, no story to tell. Now that mightn't worry you or me, but it did to me one for the place where he was working every day. The other men, they used to be telling him at dinner time the grand dreams they had the night before, places they were, the tall buildings, different nationalities, dancing in colored flagstones, and the company where they were, and the wine, and the songs, and the dancing, and everything, until they had the poor man driven demented and he was losing the color, and he went along to discount. That was the shopkeeper's name. For his motto was, take a pound's worth and I'll throw off a bob. And as prime a bio as you'd meet from here to the town of Kildema. And when discount heard uh, the tale of woe of Timmy Warren, he began to laugh in his own mind and he said, your if every riddle was as easy unraveled as that, life would be heaven. If you want to dream, Timmy Warren, all you have to do when you'll go home tonight is to put out the fire. Bring the bed down out of the room, set up the bed inside in the fireplace, and let yourself and Sheila go to bed there for the night. And if you are dreaming before morning, my name is not discount. So he came home to the wife, but it took him from there until 10 o'clock to convince the wife to fall in with his plans. And she said, if the subtle fall down on the bedclothes, she said, is it you that'll be dancing in them below on the river? But if I didn't say it before, I'll say it now. There is great credit due to the women of Ireland and the lengths they'll go to, to humor a cranky husband. Finally, she fell in with his wishes. And the fire was put out and the bed was brought down out of the room and set up inside in the fireplace. Fireplaces at that time were so big you could dance a set inside them. And uh, Timmy Warren and Sheila, they went to bed for the night. That was his wife. And he was only a short time asleep when he heard someone knocking at the door. And Timmy said, who is that? 
And the voice starts so I said, "'Tis me, discount. Get up to me, Warren, and take this letter to America." So he got up and he had to his discount was there and he got into his Sunday suit and he put on his hat and he took his legs into his shoes and he went down to the door and he took the letters from discount and he hit off in the general direction of America, knocking sparks out of the road with the iron tips on his heels. And it was breaking day when he came to the Atlantic Ocean and there was a big white gander there with his shoes off. He was paddling and he said, hello to me, Warren, he said, where are you after? Geese could talk at the time. Indeed, I can gabble enough always. And I'm going to America, he says to me, with this letter for discount, he said, but the trouble is, how am I going to get over? Oh, if every riddle was as easy and rabble as that's the gander, life would be heaven, hop up on my back and I'll fly you over. I'm not too heavy for you, says Timmy, when you were sitting up on the gander's back. You're heavy enough, the gander said, but we'll chance it now. So he craned his neck and he flapped his wings and away he flew. And that was the grand view Timmy Warren had sitting up on the gander's back. A lovely soft seat and the sun was shining behind him and he began to sing. The palm tree waves on high and beneath the fertile plain but the dewy hills of Kerry I'll never see again. Oh, why left I my home and why did I cross the sea and leave the small birds singing around you, sweet Rally? By this time, they were halfway across the Atlantic and everything was going smack smooth until all of a sudden, the gander said, hop down off of my back to me, Warren. Hop, hop, hop down, hop, hop down where, says Timmy? Where, where'll I hop down to, have you any sense? Hop down off my back now, says the gander. And if you don't, it'll be the worst for you. I can't fly another peg. I'm winded. And Timmy looked down to see how far he'd have to fall. <clears throat> and wasn't there a ship nearly under him in the ocean? Throw yourself down, says the captain of the ship, and we'll catch you. How do I know, says Timmy, but is <clears throat> into the ocean I'll fall and maybe get drowned? Can't you throw down one of your shoes, says the captain, and we'll see where to land. So Timmy kicked off one of the shoes. <laughs> Good job he hadn't him tightened him. And with that, there was an unmerciful roar from his wife. Is that you, Sheila? What's left to me, says she? Where are you? Wherever I am, says Timmy, I'm held. Tis like the black hole of Calcutta. I can go up or down, he said. Strike a light. She lit the candle. And where was Timmy? Thunder and turf, only halfway up the chimney. <laughs> With one shoe off and one shoe on. And then she knew what hit her. Come down, she said. You cracked fly by night. What a dream are we having you? He came down. And by the time he had the sort out of himself, out of his suit, and out of the bedclothes, he didn't care if he never dreamt again and he had to live to be as old as Methuselah's cat. <laughs> <laughs> When I was small and learning the geography of the world, there was a saying going that America was a place or state of punishment where some Irish people suffered for a time before they came home and bought a pub. <laughs> or a farm of land. Or married into land. Anyone that ever went the road to Killarney could not miss Peg the Damsel's new house was at the other side of the level crossing and you couldn't miss that either for any time ever when that way one gate was open and the other gate was shut. They were always half expecting a train. <laughs> Peg's house was done up to the veins of nicety, dormer windows out on the roof, variegated ridge tiles, the walls pebble dashed, what you could see of them, for they were covered with ivy. And in the front garden, Peg, she had ridges of flowers surrounded by a hedge beautifully clipped you may say the barber couldn't do it nicer and one knob of the hedge was allowed to grow up and it was trained to give the effect 
of a woman sitting down playing a concertina. Take herself, of course, for she was a dinger on the box. <laughs> if you heard her playing the verse of Vienna, you would never again want to turn on the wireless. How is this she had it? Father went, father went, father went, top coat, and he wore it, and he tore it, and he spoiled his top coat. Diddly ding dee da da 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 She was brilliant. Is it any woman as a small child before she was able to talk could go up to the high note and Danny by? Now of all the pauses in Peg's garden, the roses took the pride of place. She had them there of every hue. She had June roses, tea roses, ramblers, and climbers. And at the back of Peg's house, there was a farmer living, and he had a goat running with the cows, and a very destructive animal he was, too. And the goat, he came the way and broke into the garden and sampled the roses and liked them and made short work of them. Peg complained the goat to the farmer. What do you want him for, she said. With nine cows, you, you can't be shot to milk. Ah, it isn't that at all. The farmer said, goats are said to be lucky. And another thing is they'll eat the injurious herb and the cows will go there full time. If you follow me, you wouldn't have to be the chairman of the farmer's union to know that. <laughs> You'll be doing full time, says Peg, if that goat don't conduct himself for I'll have you up before the judge, the man in the white wig. Play tough now, says the farmer. A man afraid of his life of litigation, for it can light in the pocket. I have, he said, I have a donkey chain there, and I'll shorten it down to make a fetus for the goat, which he did. But the goat, when he found the timing of the chain, like the two lads in the three-legged race, he was able to move as quick-witted as without it. Now, that would be the same year that, um, that Peg married the return yank. Or was it? <laughs> so long ago now. Everything has gone away back in my pole. Twas a man that went in a fright for fancy shirts. And they do. One day, as I'll keep the shirt on him, Look at that for a caper. And the poor woman, her fingers worn to the bone, washing for him. Well, this morning, Peg the Damsel, she rinsed out her red shirt and she put it outside up in the hedge to dry. That was all right, no fault. Until the goat came the way. And handicapped and all as he was, he broke into the garden, attracted by the colour, I suppose, and Peg the Damsel opened the front door just in time to see the white button of the left cuff of the red shirt disappearing down the goat's track. <laughs> there was no good in calling the yank. He was up in the loft in Blanket Street. All night work he had in New York and he used to sleep during the day. And I said, no night work here. He used to sleep day and night. <laughs> so Peg, she went after the goat with the broom and the goat hopped up on the fence of the railway and he was running down the incline. Now, it wouldn't happen again in the rain of cats when he was crossing over the railway tracks. Didn't one link of the chain go down over the square-headed bolt that's spinning the rail chair onto the sleeper? And he was held there a prisoner. He couldn't lead nor drive. And what was more, the train was coming now. He heard it whistling. And wasn't that a nice pucker for a goat to be in? And if he were there, he'd lose your heads, and so would I. But the goat didn't. What did he do? coughed up the red shirt and flagged down the train.
I'm bringing you back now to uh, the time when tea was introduced into Ireland. And the Irish people took to drinking tea like ducks to water. Well, it wasn't available in the shops when it came out first, but men used to go around from house to house in a pony and trap selling the tea, and they were called tea men. Now, it so happened that a tea man put up with a husband and wife in a single room house in which there was only one bed. And he wouldn't have put up in that house at all that night, the tea man, only it was so wet and so stormy, he couldn't get to his own lodgings. Now he put the pony into a makeshift shed that was at the gable of the house outside. And when he went in, the young woman of the house, she had taken up a cake of bread out of the oven. And she brought the cake of bread across the floor and she put it up over on the shelf of the dresser. Oh, there it was, a beautiful wheel of bread with a cross on it, like the four spokes that you see on a wheel. And the lovely aroma that was from that cake Oh, the tea man's nostrils, you could, you could see him, and you know that his teeth were swimming inside in his mouth for a bite of it. <laughs> and she, seeing the hungry look on his face, she was going to break a piece off the cake and give it to him, and the husband said, no, he said, you'll only ruin that cake now if you break it while it is hot. So can't he wait until morning like the rest of it? Well, that was that. There's no good in going arguing with a cranky husband. They knelt down and they said their prayers and they all got into bed, the one bed. The wife got in near the wall, the husband got in next to her, and then the tea man got in on the outside. <laughs> God knows, and that was a narrow enough bed too, and when one of them had turned, they'd all have to turn. <laughs> in the course of the night, you know, when the husband had to go out, he suffered from a little frequency. <laughs> yeah, that runs in families. <laughs> and when he'd go out in the yard, he'd bring the wife out with him because he was jealous to let the wife in the bed with the tea man. And she kicked up against going out into the cold and stormy night. Moreover, as she said herself, when she didn't have occasion to go out. <laughs> and finally, she kicked up altogether and wouldn't go out anymore. And then what the husband did, he'd lift up the heavy cradle with the child inside in it, and put the cradle down on the bed between the wife and the tea man. And then he'd go off out in the yard, and when he'd come back in again, after shedding the tear for Parnell, <laughs> he'd lift up the cradle and put it back down on the floor, and then get into the middle of the bed. Well, the busy night he had, about four o'clock in the morning, the storm began to rise, and he heard it blowing off the roof, off of the shed outside at the gable of the house. And he forgot all about it, like one danger will make you forget the first danger. You know, if you cut your finger, you'll forget your toothache. He forgot all about the taming and, and hopped out of the bed and went out to tie down the shed. And when he was gone, the wife turned to the taming and she said, now's your chance. So he got up and ate the cake. <laughs> Thank you.
There were also those who came home from America. Those who went to see the time. A third man was Mick the Fiddler. Mick said that the climate of New York degree with him, he got a pick in his neck from looking up at the tall buildings. The day before Mick Fiddler out for a he held his brother and his brother's wife, Mal Phil, to set the barley in the field. And Mick the Fiddler was home again in time to call. It was his brother that went to the West and Tim Tim. And Mick the Fiddler got off the side car above the gable of his own house. He looked around and said, so this is Ireland. Well, the devil sweep him and he only gone six months. He had a crease in his trousers, which he a gooseberry for you. <laughs> and the tie he had around his neck, I wouldn't any bull to eat. He didn't know any of all the people came to meet him. They weren't the same book as him going to school. In his kitchen, and be taken aback, by the way, at what talking up near the fair. said to the bride, said, say, Molly, what's long, Elbert, and she said, Mick, she 